Good morning, and we want to welcome you to this Palm Sunday service in the Chapel Without Walls. We are filming these services in the home of Scott Camp and his wife Patsy Bryson. Scott is our music director. You see before you part of a large palm branch which broke off outside their home. And so on Palm Sunday we have a palm. This is an unusual situation that we are all facing with the coronavirus. Obviously, we're living different lives than any of us has ever lived before. We've discovered that human contact is far more important to most of us than we ever imagined. Now that it is cut off and we are isolated so much of the time, we learn how much we really need one another in a situation such as this. I urge all of you to telephone friends, neighbors, and relatives. We need to hear from one another even if we cannot see one another in these occasions. We ask that you would use your solitary confinement as productively as you can and not just for entertainment on television or whatever else. I encourage you to read, especially things that you might not otherwise read were it not for this unusual situation. Don't give in to loneliness. Don't give in to fear or despair. Realize that though you are by yourself, or with just one or two other people for much of the time, we all have one another, even if we are not in physical contact with one another. So remember to continue your friendships with others. Above all, remember this, God does not cause coronavirus. Coronavirus happens because it is something that is a part of nature. Why it happens is a discussion that could go on forever. But it does happen, and how do we deal with it? That is the question that we are faced with every hour of these many days. We will continue to telecast these services in this manner until we are able to meet again in the Cyprus and have the chapel without walls together as a congregation. In the meantime, may God bless us as we go through this experience. On this day, almost 20 centuries ago, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, which at that time was regarded to be a symbol of peace. A large crowd followed him into the city, singing his praises as they strode along. Today, because of the current world pandemic, we are un unable to join together to hail the Messiah on the Palm Sunday procession. Nevertheless, by relatively rudimentary technology, we participate in a video Palm Sunday service. Let us worship God.
The first scripture reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 11. These verses are Matthew's account of Palm Sunday. And when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethany to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and he will send them immediately. This took place, what was to fulfill that which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king comes to you, humble and mounted on an ass, and on a colt, the foal of an ass. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their garments on them and he sat thereon. Most of the people in the crowd spread their garments on the road, and others cast branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Amen. Let us all pray. O Thou who hast created the entire universe and our small planet in the midst of it, from time to time we are struck by forces and challenges far beyond our control, and now is a major example of that for everyone in the world. All of us have been ushered into a situation we never before experienced, nor could we adequately even imagine it. Because this pandemic is so vast, and is affecting an increasing number of people at an increasing velocity. We feel compelled to turn to Thee, asking for Thy guidance and protection in the enormous uncertainties which confront us. We pray first for those who have died from the virus and who are now eternally with Thee. Personally, we thus far know very few, if any of them, but we thank Thee for their lives and for our Christian assurance that they now dwell with Thee in another kind of life we can scarcely ascertain. We pray for those who are afflicted with the virus, asking that Thou wouldst grant to all of them the necessary inner strength to combat it as well as they can. We pray for people who blame Thee or others for this epidemic, and whose faith is threatened by this incredibly rapid worldwide outbreak of disease. Help each of us productively to sort through our own thoughts and feelings regarding the pandemic in such a way that we may emerge from it strengthened rather than weakened in both wisdom and resolve. Keep us from ignoring lessons which can be absorbed only by a colossal challenge such as this. Once again, we ask Thee to be with all the nurses, doctors, and others who are ministering to the sick and dying, risking their own health to try to maintain the health of others who are suffering from this illness. Be with their loved ones in their fear for them and for themselves because of the danger these brave caregivers represent to their own beloved ones when human connections for most people must be broken to battle the virus, may those connections become all the stronger once the virus has dissipated. Enable us fully to trust that all things do work together for good 
for those who love thee, as well as for those who neither know nor love thee. However long this unique threat continues, help us to find in it deeper conviction in thy goodness than otherwise we could ever have known. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the everlasting focus of Palm Sunday. Amen. The second reading is a continuation of the 21st chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew tells what happened immediately after the Palm Sunday perception, procession. This is different than in the other Gospels, what happens. And it's important to realize that for Matthew, it occurred immediately after Jesus came into Jerusalem. And Jesus entered the temple of God and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that Jesus did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said, Yes. Have you never heard out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast brought perfect praise? Amen. And may the Lord bless to us these readings from his holy word and to his name be the glory and the praise. The text for today's Palm Sunday sermon is this, from Matthew chapter 21, verse 9. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! This is the fifth in a series of sermons called Via Dolorosa, about various temptations Jesus faced on his way to Jerusalem. And today we're talking about the temptation of acclaim. Never in his brief life had there been anything quite like it. All four Gospels record the incident, and each of them more or less has the same details in the story. When Jesus came into Jerusalem on what the church long ago called Palm Sunday, it says that a great crowd followed him into the city. What exactly might that mean? Fifty people? 
A hundred people? Five hundred? Five thousand? It doesn't say. But perhaps the Palm Sunday throng was the largest group ever to see Jesus at one time in his entire life. However many people there were there on that Palm Sunday, we may readily deduce that they gave Jesus a public acclaim that had, he had never received before. In the Galilean ministry, there were probably not large crowds who followed him because there were not that many people who lived in the Galilee in Jesus' time. In Jerusalem, during Passover, thousands of people came to the holy city from all over the world. Jews wanting to go up to the temple for one of the greatest holidays of the Jewish year. Besides those people, there would be the thousands who already lived in Jerusalem. So it's quite possible that there was a very large crowd who followed Jesus into the city and up by the temple. And if we accept the authority and authenticity of what all four Gospels proclaim, it was with great anticipation and exuberance that they came marching into Jerusalem that morning as Jesus rode on a donkey. He had specially told the disciples that it would be waiting for him in a village by Bethany. And they went and it was there. He chose a donkey because a donkey was a symbol of peace and he wanted people to understand that he came in peace, not to bring war. A claim follows quickly after successful major events. For example, let us suppose that a medical researcher yesterday found a vaccine for the coronavirus. And let us further suppose that within a month he had seven and a half billion dosages of that for everyone in the world. If that were the case, his fame would be far greater than that of Dr. Jonas Salk. Dr. Salk would be an also ran in the sweepstakes of medical research. So it was that on Palm Sunday, Jesus came into the city in great acclaim. Before we speak further about what happened on that long ago momentous day, let's review this whole series of Lenten Via Dolorosa sermons. As I said in the first one, and then alluded to in each of the following sermons, when Jesus left Galilee and went to Jerusalem, all along the way, he was faced with various temptations. The way to the cross is called the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows. In the old city of Jerusalem today, there is a sign at the place on one of the streets in the old city which says where the Roman Praetorium was. This was where the governor lived and was the seat of Roman government in Palestine at that time. Then there are other signs that point on a way leading gently up a slope toward what is called Golgotha. Calvary, the hill upon which Jesus was crucified. That mile journey is known as the Via Dolorosa. Golgotha is a Hebrew word which means the place of the skull. Apparently the hill that was there outside the city wall looked like a skull from a distance. In many Catholic churches today, there are paintings or 
small sculpted pictures around the outside of the sanctuary depicting the stations of the cross. Each one tells what the Bible or tradition says happened to Jesus on the Via Dolorosa from the Praetorium to Calvary. Those stations of the cross are very sacred to Catholics. They look at them and they are reminded of what Jesus went through. It would take only an hour at most, even carrying a heavy cross, for Jesus to walk the way of sorrows. But in effect, the Via Dolorosa really began for him when he started from Galilee, slowly walking to Jerusalem. Luke's Gospel tells that he left for Jerusalem in the ninth chapter, and for ten chapters it gives stories that happened along the way as he went toward the holy city. He didn't go quickly, nor apparently did he intend to do so. Here's the point that I've been trying to make in all four of the previous sermons and in this one as well. On the way of sorrows, which extended a hundred or more miles from north to south, Jesus faced several temptations as he, as he strode along with the twelve disciples and with however many other people walked along with him in his pedestrian route. Specifically, he was confronted by temptations of power, normality, charisma, and self. Should he use his power to bring the focus on himself? Should he try to be normal the way everyone else was? He was not like others. But should he try to blend in? Should he use his charismatic gifts to wow people? Or should he shrink back into himself and do what most of us do far too much of the time, to focus on ourselves rather than on those around us? On Palm Sunday, Jesus heard the siren song of acclaim. Should he respond to the cheers of the loud and the loud hosannas of the crowd as he walked along? Should he seek that acclaim? Or should he look rather to the dark denouement he knew was awaiting him? If he were to accept the messianic acclamations, might he turn the crowd's enthusiasm into an armed revolt against Rome? After all, isn't that what many of the Jews wanted? And were he to do that, and were he to be killed in such a revolt, what could be better than that? He would become a national hero forever. But Jesus knew that that was not what he was called by God to do. That was the last thing that God would want of him. For three years, Jesus had publicly been telling his followers that they had to give up their lives in order for the kingdom of God to be built in the world. God, he said, loves us with an undying love, an unconditional love. He was certain that his life was meant to illustrate that. Fundamentally, the cross does not illustrate the love of Jesus for humanity. It illustrates the love of God for all of us. God will go to any measure to validate his love for us. But because God cannot literally do it himself, he chose Jesus to illustrate it on our behalf. Total love is so powerful that total evil always seeks to thwart it. Because unconditional love knows that 
unconditional evil is always working against it. Mafiosi don't spend their time playing checkers with nuns. You can be sure of that. However, it almost seems cruel that Jesus couldn't take a little time to revel in the salvation he felt at Palm Sunday. After all, didn't Luke say in his telling of the story that Jesus cried out to the disgruntled Pharisees who groused at all the cheering, I tell you, these, and he was pointing to the crowd, would, if they were silent, the very stones would cry out. And by stones, he meant the beautiful stones of the temple building or the massive blocks of stone holding up the temple mount and its platform. For a fleeting moment, Jesus' focus may have been diverted to the acclaim of the crowd, but he came back. Where would such a claim lead? To a detour, to a way other than the way of sorrows, the way of the, the Via Dolorosa. If you can't bear the cross, then you can't wear the crown. Only by defeat could Jesus' victory be won. Only by dying could Jesus lead the way to eternal life. What kind of Messiah was Jesus going to be? How would he be perceived in coming centuries? That was the question which gnawed at Jesus all along the way to Jerusalem. His disciples and most of his followers wanted him to be a Messiah other than the one he wanted to be, which was the one he knew God wanted him to be. He would not be a triumphant servant. He would be a suffering servant. He would not conquer by a sword. He would conquer only by means of transforming human hearts or else he would not conquer at all. Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What sort of a Son of David? Comes to do what? Raise an army? Forcefully attack the Romans? Or the temple priests? or the securely entrenched religious authorities? The Palm Sunday processional shouted to Jesus' ears to do just that, but he knew it was not what God wanted for him. More than any other gospel, Matthew points out the immediacy of how Jesus overcame the temptation of a claim. It was illustrated in what is called the cleansing of the temple. Mark and Luke take longer to describe this incident, and they say that it happened either a day or two days after Palm Sunday. Not surprisingly, Jesus puts it far ahead in his gospel and not during Holy Week. But Matthew says it, the, the whole thing in just two verses, which were included in our second reading for this morning. And Jesus entered the temple of God and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Many of you may be wondering, what's that all about? Why was Jesus so upset? At Passover, every Jew who went to the temple was required to have a priest sacrifice an animal or bird on their behalf. Since people came from all over the Mediterranean world as well as from Judea, they all had different kinds of currency or coins when they came to the temple. As is true today in every location in the world, when people go anywhere to see anything, there are currency exchanges for them 
to buy whatever they want in that particular locality, but they must exchange their money for the local currency. Jesus was infuriated by what he took to be a religious ripoff. I guess he thought the money changers were charging too much to exchange the money. Or maybe he was angry at the very notion of anyone needing a, to sacrifice an animal to atone for their sins. Or maybe he wanted to thumb his nose at the priests who ran the temple. We can't know specifically what was on his mind. But by such an open display of wrath toward the religious authorities, Jesus instantaneously blew whatever vestiges of a claim might still be ringing in his ears by such an extremist action. From the moment he overturned those tables, it was all downhill from then on. The songs of praise immediately became epithets of insults, and the hosannas quickly turned into death threats for Jesus. In other words, by doing the very thing he did, Jesus was consciously rejecting the shouts of acclaim he had just heard by his triumphal entry into the holy city of God. Any politician who wins by a landslide election wants to bask in his glory for at least a short time before he tries to effect whatever it was that was in his campaign. But instantaneously after the biggest demonstration of support Jesus ever received, at least according to Matthew, Jesus did something he knew would provoke bitter opposition to him. Thus did he himself drive several more nails into the coffin he knew awaited him. A man's got to do what a man's got to do, and a woman's got to do what a woman's got to do. But a man who is convinced he is called by God to do what only he can do, will do it, come hell or high water. And both were looming up for Jesus of Nazareth in the next five days. From Palm Sunday on, everything went south for Jesus. It was an instance of a very short-lived and probably greatly misplaced acclaim. The crowd cheered Jesus, but for all the wrong reasons. What they wanted, he wouldn't give them. And what he gave them, they didn't want. When the historical Jesus attained the, any degree of fame, it was bound to be of short duration. He was acclaimed by undiscerning but enthusiastic people to accomplish ill-conceived actions which would only have resulted in disappointing or disastrous consequences. They wanted a mighty Messiah, and they wanted him right then. But Jesus could not and would not deliver to them what they desired. They wanted a kingdom based on political and military power. He could only give them a kingdom based on love and submission to God. By attacking the temple and its system of animal sacrifice, Jesus visibly and intentionally rejected the acclaim the crowd had just shown him. Only he was capable of doing that. No one else could display such dangerous and extravagant love. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else could walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. The Via Dolorosa was harder and more sorrowful than any of us could ever imagine. Because he was so much in tune with God, and because he sensed so clearly what God wanted from him, 
Jesus knew with excruciating awareness exactly what would soon overwhelm him. He knew it not because he was God incarnate. He was convinced of it because he was the man of fathomless faith. Did Jesus succumb to the acclaim he heard on Palm Sunday? He was fully human. And what human wouldn't be swept away into the excitement of the uplifting shouts and acclamations? But only for the briefest time did Jesus allow that acclaim to ring in his ears. It was merely a fleeting and ephemeral fame. And as soon as he regained his God-given equilibrium, he realized that. Thus, whether in Mark or Luke, or in Matthew, the next thing he did, the very next thing, was to confront the, abuse, the abuses of religious authority gone very badly wrong. Nonetheless, in 2020, and in the midst of this tremendous coronavirus pandemic, it is still Palm Sunday for all of us. Even though we know what is coming on Thursday night and Friday, we are now part of the crowd, and we can clearly hear the cheers. Hosanna! Loud Hosanna! Hear the little children singing. Give Jesus His due. He needs it for what inevitably is coming. the benediction. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may the Lord hold you in the hollow of his hand. Amen. <laughs>